Okay, thanks a lot. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here today. I want to tell you about quantum unclonability. And uh, my aim is to make this accessible uh, for people of various backgrounds. Uh, please feel free also to uh, ask me questions during the presentation. I'm quiet. Um, it's on. Is there volume? Test, okay, test. Uh, test, test. Test, test. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for mentioning that. Oh, okay. So we'll go. Okay. So the starting point is the uh, well known quantum no cloning theorem, according to which uh, it's impossible in general to copy an, an unknown quantum state. So for me, when I think about quantum information and uh, this analogy, I've gotten a lot of mileage out of, that, out of this, I think much more of a, of a physical object. Um, because physical objects in our everyday lives, we really have this intuition that they can't be copied. And that is completely in, con in contrast with uh, conventional information that we can easily copy, like classical bit strings. Um, so if you look at the apple, what properties does it have? Okay, you can taste an apple, but that leaves a mark like you somebody else will notice that the apple has been tasted. Um, you can share an apple, but uh, you know um, if I keep half of the apple my friend has the other half we each have half we don't each have a full apple and uh, similarly kind of thing you, you can't copy an apple and that's completely in contrast with uh, conventional information that. Um, for instance, a live stream over zoom we can broadcast it. Uh, no problem um, when you look at the when you look at the live stream it doesn't change the live stream and um, you can share it and you can copy it of course okay so um, i'm kind of on a quest to understand what is unclonability uh, i don't have the, that answer right now um, this this is presenting you work in that direction and uh, this, these are not new questions. Actually, um, Scott Aronson here present uh, had, had a paper in 2009 that talks about these ideas and maybe where we can bring them. There's also a notorious uh, after dinner speech that's available online. Well, and, and Wiesner in the 60s. Of course, <laughs> yes. We're getting towards that. So uh, where can we get inspiration towards answering that question? And I work in uh, cryptography. And looking at historically what happened in cryptography in the late, uh, well, in the early 1980s, there was really a breakthrough in terms of um, theoretical cryptography, and that was in terms of definitions. And like in cryptography, you could say, what is security? What does it mean to have a secure system? What does it mean to communicate securely? And uh, these um, people, uh, Goldwasser and McCallie, um, really, really um, boosted the boosted this area of research by formally looking at how could we define what is security and in this paper called probabilistic encryption. And the main idea is that we can define security in terms of a game and we'll look at different parties, how they interact, and if we can bound the winning probability of some of some formal game, then we can um, we really understand that as being secure. Also, what came out of this the simulation paradigm, et cetera, but I'm not going to get, in, get into that today. So we're going to try to uh, follow a similar path, um, although I don't think that the, this path is complete yet, as much as it is in terms of security, and to understand unclonability in terms of different games and how we can uh, observe that. Um, uh, of course, uh, one of the first um, actually the first, as far as I know, use of quantum information and in cryptography is in quantum money um, proposed by Wiesner in the late 1960s. And uh, this paper is really a, a treasure. Uh, each time that I read it, I find something new that's really interesting and, and insightful. In fact, it was so much insightful and ahead of its time that it took many years for it to be eventually published. And um, uh, what Wiesner brought up is that the uncertainty principle imposes restrictions on the capacity of certain types of communication channels. And then he goes on to talk about novel forms of coding. So we're going to talk about that type of coding that Wiesner proposed. 
Uh, yeah, it was published actually um, many years later in the wake of the uh, quantum key distribution protocol that we'll be getting to shortly. Here's the idea of Wiesner's conjugate coding. So um, there's a basis theta, that's a, that's a bit, and also an, an encoded bit B. And if you want to encode B in basis theta, then if the, if the basis is uh, zero, you encode B in the computational basis. If the basis is one, you encode B in the diagonal basis. So there's four, there are four different uh, of these Wiesner states, also called conjugate coding states. And the point is that these states are non-orthogonal. If you're encoding a bit B, if it's in the uh, computational basis, you'll have zero. And if it's in the diagonal basis, you'll have plus. And it's not possible in general to perfectly distinguish those two, um, those two quantum states. So if we have a single copy of B sub theta, where B and theta are both random, first of all, if somebody knows uh, the basis theta, they can easily verify that that quantum state is consistent with B encoded in basis theta. Namely, you measure in basis theta and you check that you get the correct B. And intuitively, if we do not know the basis uh, theta, then no third party could create two quantum states that would be simultaneously uh, accepted this, via this verification process that I just mentioned with high probability. Okay, so even if you have a copy of this B sub theta, not knowing theta, then, then you can't duplicate it, or there are limitations on how well you could duplicate it, such that the, the B sub theta would be accepted by two different verifiers. And uh, that's, that's the uh, concept that Wiesner uh, suggested, and um, that's for one bit, uh, he, what he was saying is let's use a string of n bits, so n, n random bases, n random bits, and um, we'll encode that, and that's going to be called a quantum banknote. Um, so what he had envisaged is a banknote that would contain actually these, this was uh, in, uh, he had identified photons as, as the carrier of information, and uh, your banknote would uh, you know, contain all these photons, and it could be verified as authentic by the bank. Of course, um, in, um, even at that time, Wiesner had identified that there's a huge problem with this type of money. I don't suggest that you invest into it because it kind of instantaneously decoheres and would lose its value. Um, and uh, the security argument is, is, uh, is really nice. It's kind of circular, but I really want, I want to point out that uh, the word copy and duplicating just appears many times in that, in that security argument. Um, so uh, he had already kind of put his finger on the idea that, that uh, it's, it's the difficulty of copying that, co that um, allows us to, to uh, argue about security here. And this was before the no cloning theorem. This was before you know, qubit exists, qubits existed, et cetera. Um, and then uh, to, okay, so to formally argue about security, we look at, we try to find one of these games, as I mentioned earlier. Um, and this, this game says, okay, we start with one valid banknote, we'll send it to an attacker, and then the attacker's challenge is to produce two pieces of quantum information. They've, they've changed colors here, because I'm not gonna claim that they're valid banknotes necessarily. And uh, then we're going to uh, verify each one of these as, according to the honest procedure of verification. And then the question is, how does the difficulty of cloning quantum money scale with the number of qubits n? Um, this is a special case of the quantum cloning uh, problem that you may have heard of, which um, asks for um, kind of universal quantum cloners. For the special case, um, actually, it turns out the answer is three quarters to the n. Um, so this is a really interesting scaling parameter. And uh, it uh, took until 2012 to formally answer that question and to have this exact bound. And this was done uh, using um, semi-definite programming. Um, quantum money uh, has turned into a really um, productive area of research and um, uh, questions that people have been addressing is to, to make it uh, noise tolerant and uh, to make it with classical verification and also um, of, of current interest is public, public key quantum money. Um, so in what we've talked about so far 
we, we have the bank that verifies the money by measuring the basis, uh, the, the secret basis. This, is, this has limitations, namely it's only possible to uh, return the money to the bank uh, or to somebody who, who is trusted and has that information. So public key quantum money solves that situation by um, allowing anybody to verify the, the, uh, the quantum money. Uh, and then the, 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 the difficulty is if anybody can verify, how could you limit the possibility of anybody cloning the state or anybody creating the state? So we necessarily have to rely on computational assumptions and we, we have some um, much more complex uh, uh, proposals here for public key quantum money. <clears throat> That's nice. Quantum money uh, encodes a type of authenticity in a way that we can verify that a object is, uh, is authentic. That does not include information itself. So the, the next kind of level up in, in some sort of information hierarchy would be, could we encode information so that the information is unclonable? And um, this question, um, in retrospect, I guess, is, is the question that is at the origin of the BB84 quantum key distribution. The story is that um, uh, Gilles Brassard, a computer scientist from University of Montreal, uh, was swimming in the ocean in Puerto Rico. And Charles Bennett, physicist from IBM, comes up to him and tells him, hey, I know a way to um, build some unforgeable quantum money. And um, turns out that Charles Bennett had been uh, acquainted with Steven Wiesner and knew about his work um, and was trying to, to bring this up to some other level of application. And Jean Brassard, cryptographer, uh, was very much aware of uh, questions like key distribution. And um, it didn't take very long for them to come up with this idea of quantum key distribution, which really uses the conjugate coding states of Steven Wiesner as, as the a founding element that makes this, uh, these keys um, possible to distribute even in the presence of an adversary. And I would argue that quantum key distribution is the original quantum advantage. Okay, so we're talking about something that you can, you can do with uh, noisy quantum systems because we have a quantum key distribution that, that's tolerant, fault tolerant, fault tolerant and noise tolerant, et cetera. And that in this case, actually, you can't even do with classical communication. So we have proofs that this type of uh, security level is, is unachievable with uh, classical computers. Of course, the big difference is that this is a communication task and it's not a computation task. Um, so I, I don't want to go necessarily into the details of what's, what ex how exactly we do QKD. So I'll show you uh, maybe the most uh, simple cartoonish picture of QKD that you've ever seen. <clears throat> Here's how it works. Alice encodes a, chooses a random key and encodes it into an apple. And then she sends the apple to Bob. And then Bob is able to get the key. And the point of quantum key distribution is that if there is an adversary on the line, then that is um, going to create some modification into the apple. And that's, that can always be detected. So that's how, uh, in this case, Bob would know that the key is compromised and he would uh, tell Alice that the, they don't have a secure channel. Um, so the, the, this, uh, this idea of, of, of quantum key distribution uses conjugate coding in order to detect eavesdropping. So uh, in what other eras of uh, cryptography could we get this type of advantage that using a quantum encoding we're able to uh, do something that we cannot do classically. And um, so here, here are some uh, two ideas that I want to present is ways to encode classical information into quantum states and where we're going to get a security property that's not achievable uh, with conventional information. And it's called certified deletion and unclonable encryption. Okay, so what is certified deletion? Here is a, a physical analogy to kind of imagine um, how you would do this certified deletion with everyday objects. So Alice has a message and she inserts it into a safe. She closes the safe and sends the safe to Bob. 
when Bob has this safe, there are two things that he could do. He could either return the safe to Alice. When he returns the safe, Alice would know that um, her message remains secret. Okay, so there's a combination on the safe and Bob doesn't know it yet. So if she gets the safe back, she, she'll be like, okay, uh, thanks, Bob. Um, you've returned the message. I know that you have not read it. Or Bob could keep the safe and then uh, we'll imagine that in some point in time in the future, Alice will eventually reveal the combination and Bob could read, could read the message. And there's an X or here that this is a, the exclusive or meaning that he can do one or the other, but not both. This is a physical object. He has to either return it or keep it. You can't do both. Classically, this is completely different, right? You could keep a copy and return one and keep the other one. But for these physical objects, we really have this X or. So the question is, can we achieve this type of um, uh, situation in a digital world? If we have classical communication only, this is unachievable by the argument that I just mentioned. So namely, if she were to encode a message using a, a key, and this is a classical message, Bob can keep two copies. And then he could take one copy and return it to Alice to in order to convince her that it, that he's returned it whatever this is a hypothetical situation it's a proof by contradiction and he could also uh, wait for the combination to be revealed use that combination and decrypt so if you're a classical cryptographer you never really kind of even imagine this scenario because you would be like okay well there's nothing we can do the safe analogy tells me maybe there's something we could do quantum is more like objects and indeed um with quantum mechanics, we can get the best of both worlds. The digital uh, picture, yet the physical security. Um, we will encode a classical message into quantum state, and then Bob will be able to prove that he deleted the message. And not only, so, so for the quantum state, uh, we're not actually picturing that he re returns the quantum state, we're picturing that he creates a classical proof that he's deleted, deleted the message. So Alice can verify that classical proof and that will convince her that he's deleted. Or, of course, he could uh, keep, keep the message and wait until the key's revealed and decrypt it. So uh, people often ask me, what would be an application? Uh, maybe you've uh, stored your last will and testament at, at the lawyer's office. And um, at some point in the future, you're like, oh, I've changed my mind. I've changed my mind. Oh, oh please, please delete that, that last will and testament. And then like, I'll send you a new one. So with certified deletion, you can be convinced that, you're, that that information is erased and uh, you've updated your will. Okay, so how does uh, certified deletion work? Here's the basic uh, example where you can see the phenomena happening with um, just a few qubits. So um, we're, we're using a conjugate coding. There's a random basis and a random bit. Okay, previously I called these B and now it's called R. And we do this uh, Wiesner encoding. And um, there are two uh, important substrings in this Wiesner encoding. The substring uh, corresponding to the qubits encoded in the computational basis, we'll call that R comp. And the substring of the qubits encoded in the diagonal basis, we'll call that R diag. Okay, and uh, to encrypt a message, this is a two bit message in this small example, we will send this conjugate coding state, R sub theta, so the entire four qubits. And then the message M XORed with the um, substring R comp, so the substring of the qubits encoded in the computational basis. Okay, so the message is in the computational basis, and um, the uh, complementary basis and the diagonal basis is going to be used for the proof of deletion. So to delete the message, um, the recipient would measure all the qubits in the diagonal basis. And the point is that those qubits in the diagonal basis, they, um, they have a definite measurement outcome, namely uh, the R, R diag, and Alice can verify that. So uh, Alice can verify that those, those bits in the diagonal basis are consistent with the original encoding. The stars here are wildcards because those ones would be uh, uniformly random. And uh, to decrypt, well, and so the decryption will assume that you've kept the ciphertext when you decrypt, you will um, measure in the uh, theta basis. Theta is the key in this case, and that will enable you to uh, get R comp. And then you then you use this M XOR R comp, which is part of the ciphertext, in order to decrypt and compute M. 
Okay, so there's really these two parts of the ciphertext that are, um, that are involved here, the diagonal basis for the um, proof of deletion, computational basis for the, for the um, information. And how do we think about security? Okay, well, um, we'll have to define this, this game, um, which I don't have on, on a slide uh, right now. We'll, we'll have to define this game, which is, um, well, if Bob convinces Alice that he's deleted, and then the key is revealed, how well could Bob actually decrypt? So he would have to be able to simultaneously convince her that he's deleted and kind of keep enough side information so that it would be useful for him to decrypt in the future. And this kind of hints to some uncertainty relations. So as he gets better, like if you look at the behavior of Bob, as that behavior um, uh, increases in terms of producing a valid proof of deletion, uh, we have the intuition that his chance of being able to decrypt once the key is revealed would decrease. And these are um, known, of course, as uncertainty relations. And um, we have uh, quite a nice library now of um, entropic uncertainty relations, thanks to the literature on quantum key distribution that we're able to use to formally uh, prove the security. So let me go to the next example. Which is unclonable encryption. This is another example of encoding a classical message such that we'll get a property of the ciphertext that's unachievable classically. So um, think about classical encryption uh, right now. So Alice has a message, she chooses a key, she encrypts that, this is a ciphertext. And suppose some adversary has access to that ciphertext, then it's trivial for that adversary to copy it, send one to um, Bob here, and send one to Charlie here. Suppose that in the future, the key is leaked, and leaking a key is not that far-fetched. So we're, for instance, if you have a public key encryption scheme like RSA, then keys depend on the computational security of some a mathematical problem. And eventually we expect that these would be uh, broken either by a shortest factoring algorithm or uh, some other way. And so the key is leaked, which means that each of these parties is able to decrypt and get the message. Um, hence classical ciphertexts, uh, there's no way to prevent type of uh, this type of attack. And if you're a classical cryptographer, you never even try to, 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 to uh, be resilient against this type of attack. When the key's leaked, everybody can read the message. But of course, once more, here comes the no cloning theorem. What if we can prevent this type of duplicating of ciphertext? <clears throat> and um, uh, it turns out that we can, and here's a type of security that we can hope for. So we have the message again, like before, but now we're going to encrypt into a quantum ciphertext, and then the keys are leaked, and then each party produces a, a guess, the, their best guess of the message M. Um, well, we could hope for something that, okay, here the message is chosen randomly. So if the message is chosen randomly, um, uh, we ask, what's the probability that both M1 equals M2 equals the original message? Of course, if you have only M1, well, uh, this is an encryption scheme, so they could decrypt perfectly. If we're talking about both people here, both adversaries here needing to uh, perfectly decrypt, well, we could hope for um, a success probability of one over two to the N, uh, since the messages are uniformly random, they could always guess, um, guess randomly, and that would be their success probability. So uh, could we achieve this, is my question. And um, we get close to that, in some work with uh, Sebastian Lord, where we're able to achieve um, nine times one over two to the n plus some negligible um, value in some security parameter kappa. Yeah, and I want to emphasize once more that uh, you know, classically there's no such concept. We call it unclonable encryption, but what we're doing is that we're inherently preventing the, um, the copying of the ciphertext. Uh, why would you want to do unclonable encryption? Here's one possible application. So um, we could encode an encrypted movie, for instance, ahead of time before the movie release. 
So uh, it's sent in, in an encoded form to the movie theater. Um, you know, for some practical reasons, maybe you want to uh, send this ahead of time. And the day of the release will reveal the key. And then the point being here that um, at most one uh, location will be able to actually decrypt the movie and project it. Um, okay, and of course, and this is assuming no communication after the key reveal. Once the information is classical, it's, it's copyable. Okay, so you can't prevent that. Maybe we should just like watch quantum movies and then we could just be natively quantum. <laughs> Um, okay, so how do we define security? It's related, to, well, it's related to this previous slide, actually. Now what I want to do is to show you how to do this uh, unclonable encoding. Um, so to encrypt the message M, we'll use a conjugate coding, a bit string B encoded in basis theta for both random B and theta. And um, our ciphertext is going to be this uh, conjugate coding state and the message M XORed with B. Okay, so think about it for a second. If you wanted to decrypt and you had access to this, if you knew the basis theta, you could, uh, you could get B and then you could XOR it and get M. If the challenge for this uh, adversary here who gets a single copy of it and they're trying to kind of um, duplicate it if possible so that both of these people would be able to uh, decrypt in the future once they know theta. So the question is how well could they do that? That's okay, that's theta is revealed. How well can Bob and Charlie simultaneously guess this message M? Um, it turns out that we can look at some, this is a very productive picture to look at the purified version of the game. It's also what this, what's done in QKD. It's a uh, different game that uh, has the, that if you bound the success probability of this game, you'll also bound the success probability of the original game. Okay, so here's this uh, slightly different game. We have one party prepares a tripartite state, row ABC. And um, A goes to Alice, B goes to Bob, C goes to Charlie. Then we have A is going to measure in a random basis uh, theta to obtain the bit B. This is an honest behavior. We know that she's going to do that. She is then going to broadcast theta to tell B and C what was her measurement basis choice. And then the question is, how well can Bob and Charlie simultaneously guess um, sorry, this B here uh, is hard to read. So simultaneously guess B. Okay, so think about it for a second. We have a tripartite state. Um, it's adversarially chosen by Bob and Charlie. So they know how it was prepared initially. They try to create the best possible state. The point is that Alice is going to go and measure it in a random basis and then get to get an outcome. And then Bob and Charlie should be able to, they, they try to be able to, um, guess or to know her measurement outcome. If there was only Bob and Alice, he would uh, send an uh, EPR pairs. So they'd be maximally entangled and he would be able to win perfectly. What happens is that we have a second party, Charlie, and it's the same system. And because we have this monogamy of entanglement property, it's not possible to be maximally entangled on the same system between Alice and Bob and Alice and Charlie simultaneously. So the intuition is that we should have a limitation on this, on the success probability of them guessing the measurement outcome of Alice. And indeed, uh, this was um, studied in depth in this paper by Tamar Michel, uh, Fair, Kanyuski, and Weiner. And um, in 2013, um, they defined this game, called it a monogamy of entanglement game, and showed some, some applications. So we can use the exact same game uh, to bound the success probability of this unclonable encryption scheme. Um, their, their result is that the optimal bleeding probability is um, uh, a half plus one over two root two to the n. So n is the number of qubits in the encoding. So we'll use that. We also use uh, um, something called the quantum random oracle. Um, I don't want necessarily to go into the details, but that kind of um, amplifies this security. And um, we can get uh, this, uh, we can bound the success probability to, to the value that I told you before, nine times one over two to the n plus something negligible. This game of monogamy of entanglement brings up some really interesting uh, questions. Namely, what is the optimal strategy that achieves this uh, co square pi over eight winning probability? And uh, they show this in this paper 
that one way to achieve this perfect this this uh, optimal bound is uh, for the system on Alice's side to be what's called um, a bright Bart state. It's right in the middle between uh, ket zero and ket plus. And um, if this is measured, uh, you know, it's it's a single pure state. So we know the um, measurement outcome uh, probabilities in the computational and diagonal basis. And um, Bob and Charlie, their uh, states are simply uh, unentangled, and their best pro success probability uh, is achieved by simply guessing zero. There are other optimal strategies, um, and they are these uh, other vectors here. So there, um, clearly there are four optimal strategies. A question that you could ask is, are there other ways to winning optimally? And this is the realm of rigidity, uh, also called self-testing. And it, this, these, this type of rigidity questions is um, whether winning optimally implies a type of strategy in a very specific form. Uh, rigidity of non-local games, non-local games are the bell type of games, have led to some uh, really big breakthroughs in um, quantum information, namely rigidity of the CHSH game um, has led to things like classical delegation of quantum computations. And rigidity of the magic square game has led to um, one of the recent breakthroughs, MIP star equals RE. Okay, so um, the monogamy of entanglement game is not quite the same situation. It's not a, a bell inequality um, setting. So um, until now, it was completely open whether uh, monogamy of entanglement games would be rigid. And this is a question um, that we looked at with Eric Kulf. And uh, it turns out that yes, uh, if we allow these four strategies, uh, they uh, kind of completely describe the optimal strategies for winning at the uh, TFKW monogamy and timeline game. And um, we also have the robust version and um, uh, multiple rounds played in parallel. So um, using this rigidity, knowing that it is uh, that this game is rigid, we're able to get some further cryptographic applications that I'm not going to go into details. Um, there's something called quantum weak string erasure, and this can be used to build um, a building block for quantum cryptography, namely bit commitment and a quantum randomness generation in a, in a new type of model that was never that had never been considered before. Okay, um, the, was it 25 or 35, uh, Lee? 25. 25, okay, okay. So the, uh, the next level in this information hierarchy that I want to go to is uncloneable functionalities. We've talked about uncloneable authenticity, uncloneable information, encoding data. The next level is like uncloning functionalities, programs, software. So could we copy protect software? Uh, what does this mean? Well, we have a function that we want to encode somehow. Uh, preferably into a quantum state so that we'll have some sort of unclonability. And then we have a machine later on that takes the software, takes an input and wants to evaluate that function on the input. So ideally it would output f of x. And um, uh, what we want to prevent is a pirate to completely perfectly duplicate the programs such that they can both be used. So we want to prevent that these parties could simultaneously evaluate F. So um, what we managed to do is to show a type of unclonability of quantum software for a specific class of functions called point functions. These are maybe, you can understand them as maybe password verification functions. There's a single input that evaluates to one and everything else evaluates to zero. Okay, um, so I think I'll just leave it at that. That's the moral of this quantum copy protection. We're able to encode software uh, thanks to quantum information. And I'll go straight to the conclusion. So like we look, we've looked at the physical world for inspiration of building um, quantum encodings that, are, that have these new cryptographic properties. We've looked at specific games to show, to, to prove security. And I think there's still lots to be done, namely, 
in order to understand better the unclonability, and maybe maybe we can take other everyday objects and try to see how they how they could be uh, embodied in quantum encodings. So thank you very much. Thank you.